Hi, everyone. So I'd like first to thank the organizer for inviting me. I'm really happy to attend this workshop. And so the, the work I'd like to present today uh, is uh, by addressing the question of decadal predictability associated with the AMOC. What actually I'm going to present today is really more uh, what are the climate impacts uh, of the Atlantic multidecadal variability. And so assuming that the surface signature of the AMOC is the AMV, making this assumption based on the strong body of work, uh, what are these impacts and what can we expect in terms of predictability from the AMOC? So uh, all the credits for this work really go to uh, a postdoc at GFDL, Johan Riprik robert uh, who's working with myself and Tom Delworth. And this is a work in collaboration with folks at NCAR, listed here, Fred, Gokan, Steve, and this work um, uh, I'd like to thank the support from the NOAA Climate Program Office uh, for supporting this work. So uh, where should we look for decadal uh, predictability? Well, I would be really happy to find decadal predictability in many places of the globe in terms of the climate impacts. Uh, really, we expect more predictability over the ocean than over lands. And even for the ocean, we expect more predictability over certain regions than others because of the intrinsic processes that govern variability. And this is what's illustrated here by uh, this um, measure of potential predictability proposed a while ago by George Bauer that is basically a, a ratio of variance between decadal variability and total variance. And this p predictability really highlights regions like the North Atlantic, the North Pacific, and the Southern Ocean as good candidates to look for uh, skill on decadal time scale. But the picture is quite different when we go to real skill, real prediction. So when the, the models, uh, the same models that are used to estimate this potential predictability are initialized from an uh, observational estimate, um, we find quite large predict predictive skill over the Atlantic, as illustrated here. Uh, this is from a paper by Paco, uh, based on the initialized CMIP-5 uh, prediction, and it shows uh, time series of surface air temperature, global mean, AMV, and IPO uh, for the average over the years two to five of the forecast. And these are two different measures of skill. And so while the AMV is quite well predicted over this time scale, and it, uh, it's better than the uninitialized forecast shown with the dashed line here, the skill for the IPO and the PDO is, is, really, uh, is really small and none. There's no skill. And here, uh, Paco didn't show the Southern Ocean, but it also doesn't show any skill. So really, the Atlantic shows larger vi uh, predictability uh, than the Pacific. And not just for the AMV, but also uh, several studies showed that the, uh, these models, a few models are able to predict abrupt changes in the North Atlantic, like the, uh, uh, the rapid warming that occurred in the, uh, in the Supolar Gyre in the mid-90s. Um, and you, sh you saw this figure earlier, Rowan showed it. Uh, and so the, in particular, the NCAR model, the Met Office model, and the GFDL model were able to reproduce uh, this rapid warming of the North Atlantic. And uh, th the three studies showed that the initialization of the AMOC was key in capturing this warming, uh, thanks to the associated heat transport that allowed heat to be advected northward and give uh, a warming comparable to observation. So these, the models that were able to predict this Supologia warming showed climate impacts, climate anomaly that are comparable to those associated with the positive phase of the AMV as observed and, and simulated, and that include the northward shift of the ATCZ or uh, increased rainfall over India, uh, over Sahel during summer. And so the question we're asking here is, uh, can we expect some predictability over the Pacific from the Atlantic? Even if the Pacific is less predictable, could we predict some of the climate impacts arising from Pacific thanks to the Atlantic? And really to answer this question, the first step is really to ask what would be the climate anomaly simulated by our current climate models if we properly simulated the AMV. And so this is what this talk is about. I will present uh, global impacts of the AMV using observed AMV anomalies, and I will focus more on the Pacific response. If I have time, I'll talk about the Atlantic and I'll conclude. So how are we doing this? We take uh, global models, global coupled models, and uh, we restore them in the North Atlantic to observed AMV pattern. So here we are really interested in the internal variability of the AMV, so uh, we attempt to remove the forced part uh, of the signal, and we do that by uh, using a method proposed by Ming Fang Ting and colleagues, and uh, that is based on a um, maximized signal, signal to noise, maximized EOF. Uh, so this, uh, this is our estimate of the internal 
internal viability of the AMV. And so we, uh, we take only one standard deviation for each sign. We, uh, and then what we do is we restore it in the North Atlantic with a restoring time scale of 100 watt per meter uh, square per Kelvin, which is equivalent to five day uh, restoring for a 10 meter deep, uh, 10 meter mixed layer depth. And uh, so, and the, the coupling between the ocean and the atmosphere is kept free in, uh, elsewhere, outside the Atlantic. So we, we do AMV plus experiment, AMV minus experiment, and we have a control where we restore to the model climatology. And so these AMV plus experiments are done by applying this positive pattern added to a climatology estimated separately from a control model. And then, yeah, the, uh, each of these experiments are run for 20 years, but here I'm only going to focus on the 10 years, so this would be 10 year average. And here really we wanted to find some robustness, so we start with two models and we run two, two, we did the same experiment, exactly the same protocol with two models, the GFDLCM 2.1 model and the NCAR CSM1 model. So these models have quite different resolution in the atmosphere, I mean double in the NCAR model, one degree in the atmosphere, two degree in the GFDL one, and same, uh, about the same ocean resolution of one degree. Note that we have 100 members, quite many members for GFDL model and 30 members, and I look at the ensemble mean here. So in terms of the global impact, this is what we get for the summertime. Upper panel show the temperature, two meter temperature, uh, and the lower panel are precipitation. And so uh, we can see uh, that yeah, in the Atlantic, as expected, you find the pattern you impose. So the, the protocol basically works, hopefully. And uh, then uh, for, for summertime, we find in terms of precipitation impacts that are quite comparable to ha what has been documented associated with the observed AMV, increased rainfall uh, over Sahel, uh, drier over Europe, dry Western uh, North America, uh, and yeah, we, you, few impacts in terms of precipitation over land, but quite comparable signals between the two models here. The sea level pressure associated uh, with this summer signal shows mainly low pressure anomaly over most of the northern hemisphere uh, and this wave train coming from the South uh, Atlantic. If we move to the winter time, uh, the response in terms of temperature is dominated in the Pacific by this uh, negative IPV-like anomaly with uh, so cooling in the eastern part of the Pacific, warming uh, on the west. Uh, in terms of precipitation, um, not much over Europe, drying again over uh, North America, a northward shift of the ITCZ, uh, southwestern shift of the uh, SPCZ. And um, in terms of the precipitation uh, associated with the temperature IPV-like anomaly, we have this uh, weakening of the aleation law that corresponds to a negative PNA. So uh, if I'm focusing on the Pacific here, and I'll come back to the Atlantic later. So uh, what drives, so I'm going to focus first on the Pacific anomaly, so I'll ask you to uh, please only look at the Pacific for now and not for the Atlantic, I'll come back to that. So we ask the question, what drives the Pacific response here? And uh, I'm looking at the winter time and for the two models, two meter air temperature. Uh, and so, uh, to I, so this figure I showed before show the, uh, that we have this PNA, PDO-like response. Uh, uh, this is for the CM2.1 model, and we wanted to know what part of the AMV plays the largest role in driving these anomalies, and so we repeated the experiment by taking only the tropical part of the AMV pattern and another response in another experiment where they took the Supolo Jaya part, north of 45 north. And these are the, the response we get in terms of temperature and uh, geopotential height at 500 millibar in color, and this is a stream function in the upper troposphere in contour. And so clearly we see that uh, when, when it's driven by the tropical uh, AMV, we are able to reproduce uh, most of the PNA uh, pattern, but uh, that there are still some teleconnections even when there is, there is no uh, tropic there. So so, but clearly the tropical AM, uh, part of the AMV is the main driver of the, the specific response. This is the same for the CSM model, and while the response is uh, stronger in general, the same story holds. 
Okay, so what's the mechanism how the Atlantic anomaly warming are communicated to the Pacific uh, anomaly? So we, we say that there is basically a bridge between the tropical Atlantic to the tropical Pacific and then to the extratropical Pacific. And the mechanism is quite similar to what has been recently described in a number of papers recently published. Basically, the tropical warming uh, in the Atlantic leads uh, to enhanced walker circulation and drives um, um, West easterlies in the in the Western Indo-Pacific uh, that these that are associated with uh, warming and through these changes in the wind uh, through west uh, west feedbacks lead to uh, a cooling in the eastern part of the Atlantic and uh, enhanced trade winds in the eastern Pacific that drives a La Nina-like response. Uh, I forgot to say what I was showing here. I'm sorry. This is basically the time evolution of the response from the first winter to the second winter in the CM 2.1 experiment where we put this full AMV. So how basically we get uh, the El Nino-like response in the, in the Pacific by applying this AMV type anomaly. So it's really very similar to what has been proposed uh, by, by, by these studies here. So do we need uh, ocean atmosphere coupling to get this PDA, uh, negative IPV, uh, PNA response? To, 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 to answer this question, uh, we did some experiment in addition to the full AMV that I showed before. Basic, I only show the CM2.1 model here. We only did them with this model. And so what we did, we, uh, in addition to nudging the, trop the Atlantic to the observed AMV, we, and, uh, and before we had the whole uh, rest of the globe fully coupled. And here, in addition, we nudged the rest of the globe to the uh, model's climatology in, in, in this row. And the, the lower panel show the nudging with, uh, in the tropics. So basically here, uh, we also nudge the whole tropic to observe climatology. Climatology, so we kill and so we kill all the tropical the coupling between the ocean atmosphere in this region and uh, and and here we do it globally and uh, in, interestingly uh, we see that when when we kill the variability in the tropical Pacific the um, there is still a PNA-like response, PDO-like response, but the magnitude of this response is weakened by about 35%. So clearly the, 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 trop the, 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 the coupling between the, the ocean and the atmosphere is key in the, in the tropical Atlantic to get the right magnitude. And, and uh, the extratropical Pacific also uh, plays a role in enhancing these anomalies. So it's really both uh, tropics and extratropic to, that give the full response there. Uh, let's move to the North Atlantic now. The North Atlantic response is more noisy, more difficult uh, to, to find here. This is for the two models in, um, for the winter time. So we expected to find a negative NAO in response to this AMV as documented by a number of previous studies. And if we look at sea level pressure, the CSM model shows some kind of a shifted uh, NAO here, negative NAO. The uh, CM 2.1 shows something uh, much less clear. And if we look at the geopotential height, it's actually dominated by a thermodynamic response, but we have something also not, not very clear there. And so the question we ask is, is it possible that given our strong Pacific response, yes, uh, uh, that this North Atlantic direct response might be polluted uh, in a sense or just uh, changed because of the teleconnection from the Pacific. And um, so if, if we look at the uh, at, the, um, at the anomalies only driven, uh, at the response, sorry, only driven by the supolar gyre part uh, of the AMV, the two models show much bigger agreement, and here it's clearly a dipole that is maybe shows some resemble with a, a mode like the uh, shifted NAO, doesn't really project on the NAO, but it's very similar in the two models, and uh, if we look at the uh, anomaly in the Atlantic for this geopotential height at 500 millibar driven by the tropical part of the MV, they have quite opposite sign at least over Europe and high latitudes between the supolar gyre. So the contribution of the supolar gyre and the tropical Atlantic are, have op are opposite and kind of cancel each other in terms of the Atlantic. 
And so our hypothesis is that it's the PDO signal that uh, is actually uh, weakening that uh, direct North Atlantic response. And if we look in the CM2.1 model, the regression of the geopotential height associated with the PDO index, it shows some anomalies that are quite uh, similar to what we find when we only uh, drive the model with the tropical AMV. And indeed, when we uh, nudge the tropics, uh, and so we remove this really strong influence uh, through the tropical Pacific, we have a geopotential height response in the North Atlantic that is much stronger. So showing that clearly the teleconnection uh, from the tropical Pacific is influencing our North Atlantic response. So. Uh, if we let that aside, what uh, drives this North Atlantic response? Um, uh, so the direct response. So to to show it better, I removed here. We removed here the zonal mean uh, uh, to highlight the dynamical response and not just the term thermodynamical response. And this is uh, the 500 millibar uh, geopotential and the upper troposphere response at 200 millibar. And the control show the uh, upper troposphere zonal winds. And so the zonal winds show uh, a Rossby wave train that originates from the tropics and moves toward the extratropic. That's clearly this very classical response to tropical Atlantic. Uh, ST. Uh, the response is barotropic in this case, uh, and there also a, a role played by uh, storm track. Uh, the transient eddies tend to reinforce this anomaly in winter, as shown here by um, st eddy, eddies, um, storm track activity. So the eddies, uh, the climatology is shown in contour, and the, and the, 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 the shading show the, the, the response. So we have a southward shift of the transient eddy activity in the Atlantic that is consistent with uh, this negative li NAO-like uh, anomaly. So both tropical Atlantic and supologia anomaly here uh, tend to contribute to the North Atlantic response. Uh, if we try to go back to that first pl plot that I showed from George here, this is this estimate of a fraction of decadal variance explained. So how much of the variance are we explaining in, uh, in this model for temperature and geopotential height? So uh, we tend to explain not much over land, unfortunately, but still the variance explained can go up to 10%, 20% in some areas. And we were quite surprised to see the differences between the two models. So there seems to be quite different noise and variance among these two models despite the same similarity of their response. So I'd like to conclude by saying that the AMV uh, drives global impacts in temperature, precipitation, and uh, sea level pressure. They're quite similar among the two models. Uh, we were quite surprised by that. That was a nice surprise. There are many differences, in particular at high latitude, in terms of the response in the Arctic, mainly. Uh, over the Pacific, the observed uh, AMV drives a negative IPO, IPV-like response, and the tropical Atlantic appears to be the main driver of uh, this Pacific response. And the mechanism through which the uh, tropical Atlantic influences the Pacific involves changes in the Walker circulation comparable to what has been documented by previous study. And extratropical coupling in the Pacific also plays a role, I, and that was shown also in a previous study. So uh, the Atlantic warming, uh, we show that it, 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 it increases the frequency of having La Nina-like events. I didn't show PDF here, but we find a shift in the PDF. Uh, and so AMV, positive AMV tend to lead to more La Nina events in, uh, in these models. Uh, the North Atlantic response to a positive AMV also gives a, a res significant response in the Atlantic that is weak, projecting something that resembles a negative NAO, but it's shifted. We don't really understand this pattern yet. Uh, this North Atlantic direct response is changed by teleconnection from the Pacific, and this is something to keep in mind when we try to identify signals in observation and uh, in, in models, also in control. So maybe that partly explains why we have such a hard time detecting the North Atlantic response. And also, I would say that tropical and extratropical anomaly uh, must coincide to give you a significant modulation of the NAO. So as perspective and challenges, we were asked to, to, give few, to say a few words about what, the, what, what would be the perspective we see. 
so uh, I'm asking really the question, are these climatic impacts due to the AMOC? I, I pre, um, we isolated the internal part of the AMV, motivated by the fact that we wanted to identify the um, climate impact of the AMOC, but really we're not sure that this surface signature really corresponds to the AMOC signature. In particular, we show here a really big role for tropical Atlantic part of the AMV, and all the models show a very weak signature of the AMOC uh, in the tropics. We don't know if this is true or if this is a model deficiency, so, but it's really an important question we need to answer. The tropical Atlantic also that is key, as I said, is badly represented in most coupled models, and here also this is problematic if we expect decadal prediction to arise from that region. Overall, uh, we find a weak signal to noise ratio and few impacts over land, even if there are few, they are significant, but remember that we had quite many members there. So we have repeated this experiment using a 50 kilometer atmosphere uh, coupled to an ocean, so quite high resolution, and the, the signal doesn't in increase much over land, so it's not just a matter of resolution. Uh, I'd like to highlight quickly some limitation of the protocol we adopted here, but Christoph will discuss this more on Friday. Uh, we propose this experiment for the DCPP MIP, the component C. Uh, this fixed AMV pattern is, is uh, with this current protocol is okay, but this cannot be applied that way for pacemaker experiment because when we restore the model to surf sea surface temperature, there are issues that arise and models that drift, and so Christoph will talk more about that, and this is a very important point. So here, really, uh, we only isolated the influence of the Atlantic on the Pacific, but clearly the Pacific and other regions can influence the Atlantic as well. So we need to reconstruct all these teleconnections together and see uh, what's the, the, the response at the end and which one is predictable. Thank you. <laughs>